remember in the hospital, I like to share this, is the doctor said, Jason, cancer has a way of enhancing your life. You're like, I don't want my life to be enhanced. Okay, Jason, I got it. <clears throat> See it? So you okay. need to come and connect to the miracle. Miracle number one. Okay. Are we good? Yep. No, I'll follow you. <laughs> if you're not having fun, you're not you're not enjoying grieving. So, <laughs> so, so nine months later, after fighting cancer, we said goodbye to my wife. I have two boys, and it began to be a life that was so hard and difficult. Here's my two boys um, saying goodbye to my wife, and all of us have this story or some of these emotions come up in this very meeting. Can you feel those? Raise your hand if you can feel them. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want you to be aware of those because those are real. I don't want you to fight them. Just allow them to come up and then let them pass as they go. This is my story. This is how I became a part of the club. So as the journey goes, many times at work, we feel like this. <laughs> or we're at church or we're home and we're just crying. Many times we're like this, we can't focus. We have widow's fog, right? I wish I had my video. My, a good example of widow fog for me is I, my son came up to me and he said, Dad, I want to earn more Xbox time. What can I do? And my brain wasn't working properly and I couldn't think straight. And I just said, Boston, go outside. This is a true story. I have it on Facebook. <laughs> Go outside and braid the watermelon plant. <laughs> I, I just threw it out there. And I went outside. I'm in the backyard. And I'm like, what is going on with the watermelon? And he had taken time. He was about 13 at the time. He's a teenager. And he braided the watermelon plant. And he says, Dad, I did what you asked. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, I need to work on this widow brain because it's not good. <laughs> so I think we be patient with yourselves because that can happen as well. And allow yourself to heal through this process. It's a process. It's not a race. So be patient with yourself. Many times we don't know where to go. Where do we go? How do we pick up the pieces? Um, where do we go? Anybody feeling this today? Mm -hmm. Raise your hand. Awesome. Not awesome, but I'm glad we're here together to help each other. Um, anybody feel helpless and hopeless? We're all friends. We can raise our hand. Those are the real feelings that we feel during a part of feeling like we're in this club. Um, welcome to grief, right? The club. The, the club, have you heard this? The club that you did choose to sign up for. Yeah, I see a, a bunch of head nods, yeah. And that's where we're at. Yes, sir. I'd like to make one statement. Yes. And it's something I want. I've been to it twice. Okay. And uh, grief and joy are not mutually exclusive. Okay. All righty. You know, I, 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 I had joy knowing that my wife was Alive and kicking on the other side in grief that she was gone. Uh -huh. And and I could embrace both at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Words of wisdom. Thank you for sharing that. And you've gone through it twice. Yeah. Okay. 27 it... years apart. Uh -huh. I, I was 44 when the first one was killed instantly in a high speed T bone accident. Can I ask a real question? <laughs> you ready from a therapist? Does it get easier? Okay, I'll give you another word. <laughs> What's that? The key to it is to understand the second verse of Second Nephi, where it says, consecrate dying affliction. Hmm. Consecration is one of the most important doctrines yes. to learn, to idealize, to actionalize in our mortal state. 100%. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Did you want to share something in the back? Just get another question to ask. Oh, I asked, does it get easier the second time around? So I, hopefully, 
many of us won't have to do that, but that's the reality of it. So um, I, I found some pictures that kind of describe how I felt my grief. Being in a hole, there's light and I can't get out. Another picture, I mean, this is not me, but feeling like you are stuck and you really can't move or you can't get out. So I wanted to paint a picture so we can feel bring up those emotions of how we're feeling in that grief. We feel like we're in dead end. We feel like we can't get out. And for many of us, we're looking for answers and we're thinking, how can we figure this out? And many of us try to choose the dude on our own. I see, I hear a couple chuckles. Many of us choose to invite people into our lives. Many people ask God to help us. And it's all different how we do this, but we need to figure out what works for us and what helps us. Where, where do I go? Where do I turn? We're just like, stop. I had enough. Anybody there? <laughs> okay. All righty. No friends? <laughs> Almost, right? <laughs> okay. So I want to introduce, I, my, by training, I'm a clinical therapist. So I've been doing therapy for 15 years. I've helped people with trauma, with addiction, with depression and people with grief. Um, it's not fun helping people in grief when you're going through grief, just for the record. But I've learned a lot through my experience. There's a term I want to introduce you today that is called selective awareness. Like, what the heck? Before you say, Jason, don't introduce me to any of that psychological mumbo jumbo. Let me teach you about selective awareness. The process by which our brain selectively focuses on certain stimuli while ignoring others. It is a cognitive process that allows us to filter out irrelevant information and focus out attention on what is most important or relevant to us as a given moment. So our brain will focus on something, whether we're subconscious or unconscious. Conscious or unconscious. And I'm going to give you guys an example because you guys already have this skill. So I'm not going to teach you a skill that you don't know about. You already do. How many of you have played the game? Slug bug. <laughs> <laughs> this, in a sense, is selective awareness. Because as a kid, when you choose to play this game, you say, okay, in my head, I'm going to start looking for slug bugs. And you're in the car and you start looking. And even when you're not looking, you're looking. And then what's the amazing part about selective awareness and slug bug? What happens when you stop playing the game, you guys? Not as much, though, right? No, that's true. Because you turn it off in your brain. Some people may not know what that is. Just let me know. So, like what? Yeah, I've never she told me what it is. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. It's weird that I've never heard of it, but I okay. don't have. Thank you for clarifying. So slug bug, punch buggy, slug bug. Whenever you see this, you yell out slug bug or punch buggy. And then you get a color. It's a road trip game. Then you get to punch your brother. Or in my case, me and my companion would be on our bikes and we would be playing this. Not the best example, but so that's what slug bug is. But it's selective awareness where we activate it in our brain and we begin to go look for those things in our life. Let me give you some more examples. Hold on, sir. Uh, slug bug blue. Selective awareness can happen when you're playing slug bug. Or remember when you focus on a new car, all of a sudden your new car starts popping up. Everywhere. It's like, what the heck? I'm seeing this all over. Uh, positive or negative people. If we get in a negative funk, we begin to attract them or we begin to see them all the time. People or things on social media, although they have logarithms that bring those to us. Um, relationships, grief, happiness, or unhappiness, or even, I'm here to testify, tender mercies and miracles. We can create opportunities to invite miracles into our lives. So selective awareness is a principle that you guys have already used. 
but now I'm going to change it a little bit to introduce you to, well, hold on, hold on. I forgot about this. Here's, a, here's my own quote I came up with. Waiting for a miracle without any work is like sitting in a parking lot while playing the game of slide <laughs> And, and what I'm trying to teach is if we're just going to sit and wait for a miracle to happen, unfortunately, you're going to be waiting a long time. Miracles require us some effort and work to invite <laughs> it into our lives. And today I want to teach you some principles that you guys can do to be able to bring miracles into your lives or activate selective awareness to bring miracles into your lives. That's why I call it miracle awareness, right? Pretty creative, huh? <laughs> so today, we're going to go over these principles and how they relate to gospel principles. So miracle awareness, we're going to talk about reframing, and, that's a, and, and we'll go over into detail about these. We're going to talk about gratitude, becoming your best self, service, and connecting to God. Give you a minute to take a picture. <laughs> access to your PowerPoints or no? Um, I will write up my email, and if you email, here's. I'll write my email right here. Jason at hopekit.com. Say and then just say you're from the conference, and I'll send you my slides. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So let me teach you reframing. This is a beautiful, beautiful principle, especially with someone that's stuck in grief, stuck in depression, stuck in anxiety, is teaching yourself how to look at things differently. The best, one of the best examples that I found in the scriptures are the woman at the well. Do you guys know much about the woman at the well? Mm -hmm. Here's some things that I learned this week that I thought was so powerful. Remember the woman at the well, she had been married five times. Do you guys know that? Great. Mm -hmm. And currently living with a man who has was not her husband. Yeah. The details have led some scholars to suggest that the women, woman may be ostracized by her community as divorce, remarriage, or not highly regarded in the Jewish and Samaritan culture at a time. So this woman was felt broken, like I'm not wanted, nobody wants me, and nobody wants me around. It goes on, the women encounters with Jesus at the well was a, a significant turning point in her life as it led her rec recognizing Jesus as the Messiah and sharing her experience with others in her community. And this is the part that I really love. It is also notable that Jesus did not judge or condemn that woman for her past, but rather offers her living water and salvation through belief in him. I think many times we think when we go through the grieving process is we begin to tell ourselves we are broken, we're not lovable, nobody cares about us. We start this negative that sits in our head. And every time you start to say that in your in your head, emotions start to attach to those thoughts. And it keeps us stuck in that cycle that continues to build us and beat us down. And that is a terrible place to be in. And it's really hard to get out of. So today I want to re help you reframe things. So something that some people will say, grief has made me a shell of who I once was. Mm -hmm. Here's a couple of examples of reframing this phrase. Grief has made me a more compassionate person. See the difference there, you guys? It helps you to feel the emotions you need to heal and get to a better place. Can you go back just a little bit? What's that? No, no. Oh, okay, no. Okay, there. I'm sorry. Uh, that one. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry. Hi. You're good. You're good. That's my I am. Yeah, we're here to learn and help. So next one, grief is facilitating the beauty inside of me. Isn't that so wonderful? It's helping us teach us what we need to 
feel and experience through the grief process. Grief is helping me become my best self. So today, as you think about your experience, I want you to, in your mind, think about how can I reframe what I keep telling myself over and over and challenge your thought process so that you can be in a different spot to be able to be open for miracles, tender mercies that are going to start coming to you in your life. Yes, sir. So as I would teach the same idea, my, 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 my headline was, oh, grief is the gateway to joy. Without, without grief, joy doesn't have a position. It doesn't have a place. It doesn't have, it doesn't have meaning. It doesn't have emphasis. It doesn't have all the splendor that's around it. So grief is just, just as death is what makes life meaningful. Grief is the gateway to joy. Grief is the gateway to joy. Thank you for sharing that. That's powerful. That's powerful. So begin today to reframe the way that you look at grief and look at, at it so you can learn and grow from it. Next principle is living in gratitude. <laughs> what I say about gratitude, I found from Bonnie Parkins. Gratitude is a spiritually filled principle. I never thought of it like that. It's a spiritual filled principle. It opens our minds to the universe, permeates with richness of, of a living God. Through it, we become spiritually aware of the wonders of the smallest things, which gladdens our hearts with their messages of God's love. The, this gr grateful awareness heightens our sensitivity to divine direction. When we communicate gratitude, we can be filled with the spirit and connect to those around us and in the world. So gratitude is such an important principle that we need to adopt in order to be able to be connected to God and to people that we want to invite into our lives. So living in gratitude can invoke a sense of wonder, gladness, spiritual awareness, sensitivity, connection, and happiness. However, it's important to remember that gratitude doesn't necessarily eliminate other emotions, such as sadness, anger, and frustration. Rather, it can coexist with those, these emotions and provide a perspective that helps us navigate them through a more positive way. So what gratitude can do many times is I lost my wife and I'm going to work and I'm just thinking about all the responsibilities that I had to do. And I was failing as a dad. I was failing getting my kids lunch, getting them clothes, getting this, this, and I was feeling overwhelmed. So what I began to do on a regular basis as I drove to work, turned off the radio and I began to say what I was grateful for. I'm grateful for the sky. I'm grateful for my car. I'm grateful for air conditioning. And it began to be a process to help me take away the pain that I was feeling in the moment. And it gave me an emotional timeout <laughs> that gave me a relief from the pain that I was feeling on a regular basis. Yes. Um, I have identified personally in some of my own work that I'm developing now uh -huh. that there are four virtues to intelligence. And the third one is gratitude. Yeah. Awesome. That gratitude is essential to learning. Yeah. Absolutely. Right here. Me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm doing the American Heart Challenge this week mm -hmm. with my with his monthly my school. And one of the things they challenge you to do is say something you're grateful for every day because it does help our health too. Not just physical. So if you want to be healthy, believe in gratitude. Awesome. So here's just 10 ways to be in gratitude. And I can send this to you by email. But a couple of things I want to point out. I've never heard this, but I thought this was an amazing idea. Is um, keep a gratitude jar. So get a jar and then write down all the things you're grateful for or your kids and put it in there as you go. And then when you're having a bad day or a difficult day, you pull those out and you read them. And how powerful that could be for kids to be powerful for us to be able to remind us of the things that we're grateful for. Um, I follow uh, a YouTube personality that um, 
she had challenged herself one year to um, keep a gratitude journal of one thing she was grateful for, one good thing that happened every day of the year. And that spring, she had a horrific miscarriage. And because it had already been ingrained in her by the end of the day, even though literally that day it would have been the horrible day to try and find something to be grateful about. She still made that a conscious effort to find something to be grateful for. And when she found that her husband had taken care of her so lovingly and tucked her into bed, and she wrote that down. Instead of laying down and being miserable and going to sleep, she ended that horrific day on a bit of a spiritual, like a little high. Amazing. So. Amazing. There is so much power in gratitude. And however we adapt it into our own life, and these are just suggestions. Find what works for you, whether it's a jar or for me, I, I adapted this one where I find five people to send a text out of the, what I'm grateful for. And when I send those out and I just send them out to the universe, then they come back to me when I'm having a bad day. Hey, Jason, just thinking of you. So kind of a pay forward thing to be able to bring me happiness and joy. So create a gratitude collage, saying, saying thank you often, um, practice self-compassion, be, be um, compassionate towards you and your learning, find gratitude in difficult emotions. I thought that was a powerful one. I'm still working on that one. And then make a gratitude list. Um, so just create, pull out a piece of paper and just start writing everything that you're grateful for. And don't stop until you're done. Or I may have done a gratitude prayer. You ever done one of these? <laughs> Where all you do is just say a prayer to Heavenly Father rather than Heavenly Father, I'm having a rough day. I need this, this, and this, and this. Just be grateful and then just be done. I don't think Heavenly Father gets too many of those. <laughs> we know that an eagle flying high in the sky has a, a, a view of things that's so amazing. You can pinpoint that mouse. And we have to remember that God has this, you know, pinpoint view of things and I love your gratitude there. I've noticed that even sometimes when I thank the Lord for things like all that have happened, like I got in a fender bender uh -huh. and I slammed my hands on the thing and I said it's really quite and goes, I kind of did remember the little things around the outside of your window and the fog upside windows. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. So thank you for sharing that. I, was, I wasn't going to share this until the end. I'm going to invite my wife up here mm -hmm. <laughs> to tell a story about living in gratitude for a trial that has happened in her life. This is my wife, Kirsten, and we got, <laughs> we got married last January, and we're both widowed. And uh, I, I've invited her to tell a story about living in gratitude and sometimes you can't see the gratitude in the moment, but then when we step back, it allows us to be able to be grateful in the moment. Um, so my late husband, his name is Cody. Sorry, can you go just real oh, quick yep. and see you on the camera? Thank you. There you go. There we go. <laughs> um, he was uh, diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia about this time three years ago. Do you remember what happened about this time three years ago? <laughs> what what happened? Yeah, the world shut down. He it literally he was diagnosed a month after everything shut down. So with leukemia, you have to go into the hospital. You have to stay in the hospital for a really, really long time. Like all your treatments are all in the hospital. And um, we were living in Memphis, Tennessee at the time. And then we got sent to MD Anderson in Houston away from everybody. I mean, we didn't, we didn't have any family anywhere near us. And um, of course the hospitals were locked down. Um, no visitors, it was like a fortress trying to get in to see anybody. And um, in Memphis, I couldn't be with him at all. And then when we went down to Houston, I was able to be with him. But once I went into the hospital, I couldn't leave. And if I left, I couldn't go back in. So we lived at the hospital for about three months. Mm -hmm. um, when, when I was told that 
Cody had a 1% chance of survival, less than 1% chance of survival. Um, that was a, that was a hard day <laughs> um, because they said he's probably got 12 to 24 hours left mm -hmm. and he was struggling to breathe. He had pneumonia. And so I, I met with the doctor and then I went back into his room and there was a nurse in the room and I said some things to Cody like that would probably sound very familiar to us, right? I said, it won't be long. I'll be with you soon. Um, we'll always be together. You know, things things like that. Well, what the nurse heard was something different. Any guess what maybe happened? She thought you were going to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. she, thought I was, she thought I was going to commit suicide. So a few minutes later, if, like it really felt like a few minutes later, about six people walked into the hospital room <laughs> And they said, we need you to grab your ID and you need to come with us down to the emergency room. You're being admitted. Oh, and I was oh like, what? But I, I was so confused. I didn't understand. And so like, they didn't tell me for what they just grab your ID. And I'm like, okay, you just told me my husband's going to die in the next 12 to 24 hours. I, like, I don't understand what's going on, but I do what you say because you are the doctors. And so they took me down to the ER. And they said, we do need to put you on suicide watch. I wasn't suicidal, but I said some things that maybe made the nurses feel like um, I was. I was, And um, so they admitted me and they put me in my own room and I had to be under observation for 24 hours, 100% observation. My husband is actively dying and they admitted me and I could not be with him. I could not be with him. And um, it's a miracle that that happened. I know it's hard to believe. And it's easy for me to look at that situation and be really, really, really angry about it. My husband ended up living for another six days. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of time together. But what happened was the rule at that hospital was a patient could have one visitor. So because I was a patient and my husband was a patient, my parents flew immediately into town and one got to be with me and one got to be with him. And then when Cody's parents got into town, which they didn't think they were going to be able to make it to say goodbye to their son, um, one got to be with me and one got to be with him. And the nurses did end up breaking the rules and allowed us to be in the room together they kept me admitted for three days under suicide watch <laughs> because it allowed our families to get there and it allowed us to be together um not a lot of people were given this, this miracle um during the time of covid but because of something you know i i really it's taken me a long time to be able to look at that and say that was a miracle and i'm so grateful that i was put on suicide watch <laughs> but Oh, I am so grateful because it wasn't about me. It was about my husband and it was about making sure really that his parents got there. Cody was the second of their children that they lost to that cancer. They ended up losing their third and his wife is here with me, my sister-in-law. Um, they lost all three of their boys to cancer. And um, the, the, the fact that, you know, I, I could be so bitter. I really could be so bitter. That was 24 hours that I didn't have with him. But his parents got there. They got there. They flew from Utah to Houston immediately. And I will tell you this, Satan tried everything to keep them from getting to Houston. And I mean everything to keep them from getting there. But they got there and they had their time with him. So anyway, that's my story of being grateful in what could be just one of the hardest, hardest memories of the hardest, hardest events of your life. Thank you. She doesn't share that with a lot of people. Uh, no. uh, it's a little embarrassing to be like, I was put on suicide watch, but <laughs> well, we're, we're 150 of your new best friends. It was, but, but actually, if you don't mind, I, I will tell you this. Um, it happened again after I was, uh, after I was released. Um, from or, or, or a discharge, you know, I was still at the hospital because my husband was still alive. And I said something else that triggered a different nurse. And so oh, at that time, the, the head psychiatrist came in and he pulled me out. And, and I said, this is what I said. 
and I'm sorry, these are just my, these are my beliefs. These are my religious beliefs. I believe that we'll be together again. And he said, what religion are you? And I said, I'm, I'm LDS. And he goes, I can tell. <laughs> I think he was probably used to, you know, those comments. And anyway, that's. <laughs> I, I, I asked Kirsten to share that and she doesn't share that very often. So uh, I felt the spirit I should share. And so I hope that allow someone today that is hurting to be able to look at things differently and to be able to say, Heavenly Father, that is a blessing. And I want to be able to be grateful for it because I need to look at it differently. Remember the, the hymn, Count Your Blessings? Count Your Miracles, name them one by one. Count Your Miracles, see what God has done. There's, a, there's power in being grateful for what you have. Being grateful to be in the, in the suicide watch. <laughs> being grateful to lose your, your spouse. Um, there, there's so much power in this. I think there's another principle I want to teach, and, and this is coming from the, the therapist, is learning to become your best self. Um, I think there was a moment when I woke up, and I've been taking care of everybody took care of my wife, took care of my boys. I'm a clinical therapist. I'm taking care of my clients. And I felt like I became a shell of my, my, myself. And I remember one morning looking in the mirror <laughs> and I just began to cry because I was a shell of myself. And I thought, what happened to me? And I forgot about me and working on myself. And what it did is it prevented me from inviting miracles and people into my life because I was afraid, I was ashamed, I was embarrassed, and it didn't allow people to be invited into my life. So what I what we can do to be able to help ourselves to become our best self is doing self-reflection. This allows you, whether you do it um, in the morning where it's quiet, kids are still asleep, and you have some time to self-reflect, write things down in a journal, to be able to learn about yourself or have the spirit whisper, what are the things you need in your life to become better? That can be a powerful moment or even turning off the radio as you're driving to work and just say, okay, Father, what do I need to learn today? How can I be blessed? Self-care is so important. Self-care can be different. Self-care can be, go get your nails done, right? <laughs> Ladies, you can say, a therapist told me to go get my nails done. So um, taking care of yourself, eating right, exercising, and feeling good. When you feel good on the outside, you're going to feel good on the inside. Uh, lifelong learning. I'm glad you're here. This is education. This is like school. This is like widow school, right? <laughs> we take away what we learn, but if you come here, and you don't apply anything that you learned, how effective was it to come? Mm -hmm. This is your opportunity to learn and to grow, to pull a widow and say, what's your experience been like? Tell me what's been hard. This, in these rooms, are so much education and power, but we need to reach out and ask, what did you go through? Everybody's experience is different. Everyone has something to teach us. So be not afraid. That sounds like a scripture. Be not afraid <laughs> to be able to ask and talk and share. And even on the, the social media platforms, such a great time to be able to learn and grow. And then the mantra that the Strombergs adopted is into the storm. If you know anything about buffaloes is they face the storm. Mm -hmm. Other animals run the other way and hide. Buffaloes, they face the storm head on, and actually run into the storm. And what it does, it allows them to grow through in the storm and get stronger. It allows the storm to not last as long. So there's power in the phrase, into the storm. And then obviously service, service, service. This gives you an opportunity to think about someone else and allow the healing power of the atonement to work on a regular basis. Remember the scripture, Mosiah chapter 2, verse 17. And behold, I tell you these things that ye may learn 
that you may learn that when you are in the service of your fellow beings, you are only in the service of your God. There's power in service, finding ways to serve. Service provides a sense of purpose and meaning. Service provides healthy distractions. That might be a really good one for someone here today. Service provides opportunities for social connections. You might find your closest people, your friends, your people to get outlets to be able to feel that pain. Opportunities for personal growth as you serve. There's so many service opportunities. We just need to be open and go find those. And then sense of satisfaction and accomplishment. Service can be the healing power that helps you through the, the pain that you're feeling. <laughs> and it might be able to give you a chance to feel your spouse <laughs> or your child because you are close to God. The size, timing, and results of a miracle are not measures of our faith, okay? I want you to remember that. That was powerful when I saw this. And I wanted to put this in is the size, the timing, the results of the miracle are not a measure of our faith. So as we go through this, continue to have faith. And just because you're not having the miracle that you prayed for, right? Kirsten, what was the miracle you prayed for in the hospital? Oh, that he would live. Yeah. Did you get your miracle? I didn't. What's the miracle that you received? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, what did your dad say? When 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 did he say that phrase? Um, well, it was when I was going to give a talk in church. Oh yeah. What did he say to you? He said, "Well, I I was asked to give a talk on miracles," <laughs> and uh, he said I was talking to him, and he said, "Are you, what miracle are you going to talk about? The one you didn't get, or the one you just married?" <laughs> so it's all about it's all about perspective. Oh, well. So stay connected to God. He will be there. He's right by you. He understands. He'll be there in the closet. He'll be there in your grief. He'll be there when things are hard. But continue to turn unto him, and he will have his hand outstretched for you so that you can apply these miracles. Robert D. Hell says, turning to our Heavenly Father in our moments of deepest sorrow can bring comfort, solace, and hope. He will wrap us, he will wrap us in his loving arms and fill us with peace, which surpasses all understanding. As we look back on our lives and our miracles, it was a miracle that me and Kirsten were able to come together and be able to be married. That is our miracle. And sometimes we think that's my miracle. I'm here to testify that might not be your miracle. And I'm have a hard time saying that, but I want to be open and honest. Your miracle might be your transformation of you becoming your best self. Your miracle might be connected to someone and you are the instrument in helping them heal. That might be your miracle, but we need to be open to what God has for our miracles. For me and Kirsten's miracles is, that's the hospital. Our, our miracle is we going to be together and help each other. And as we work together, we are open to talking about each other's spouse as, as if they were still in our lives. And it helps us through the grieving power and it helps us to apply the atonement in our, in our lives. One of the miracles that we also experienced is last year and Kirsten said, the doctors told her she would never ever have kids. <laughs> Last year, we found out that we were pregnant. Yeah. Uh -huh. we, and, and in December, we invited a sweet little girl into our lives. That is a blessing. And what's the blessing here is we can see parts of my wife. We can see parts mm -hmm. of Kirsten's husband mm -hmm. in her. And we're able to continue to have our miracle and our loved ones into our lives. That's our miracle. Mm -hmm. And our miracle is we get to help people and tell them that miracles are possible. Mm -hmm. I don't want to create a crowd. Our miracle's over there. Our <laughs> sweet little girl. But last on Sunday, we bless Macy um, and, and we're able to give her a blessing.
that was so special and invited so many spirits on the other side into that circle. Mm -hmm. I testify miracles can happen. Miracles can happen for you, but we need to do the work to be able to involve the things we talked about so God can bless our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. I have one regret. We didn't put uh, this is not being photographed, is it? Yeah. Is this being video? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. We're doing it, we're doing it again. Because I would but this was the best known. <laughs> <laughs>